Hello there, and welcome to episode 25 of Syracuse Sports. My name is Brent Dax. I'll be your host for the evening. Wow, we're at 25 episodes. You know why we're at 25 episodes? Because my boss made me do it. No, because you are watching, and you're listening, and you're subscribing, and you're following, and we just keep making more. So thank you for being a part of this uh, journey to 25 episodes. Uh, but if you haven't done so yet, YouTube, Spotify, Apple, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us, Syracuse Sports. And you can make yourself a part of the show as well. 315-552-1964. That is our voicemail. Yes, it's 2023, and we're still using voicemail, right? And you're using it. You can use it anytime. If you're watching a game, you think of something, hey, Brent, what do you think about that? Fire us off a voicemail, and we'll hear from you on the show. You can get in touch with me, Brent Axe Media on X, and email B-A-X-E at Syracuse.com. Make sure you take note of whatever you prefer there, a tweet, a voicemail, an email, however you want to get in touch, because we have a mailbag episode coming up that's going to be all your questions. So whatever you want to do, voicemail, Twitter, email, send me a message, and we are going to do an, an upcoming episode of Syracuse Sports based entirely on your questions, your thoughts, your comments. So please, I'll leave it up there on the screen on YouTube if you're watching there for a minute so you can uh, make note of it to send us a note and ask your questions, comments, anything you want to talk about in the Syracuse Sports realm. Let me know if you have pop culture questions or what I think about the Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey relationship. Hey, I'll go in on that as well. I have many thoughts, but you got to ask the questions mailbag episode coming up. So we're looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to you here in this conversation with David Hale, who is our guest today. David is a terrific sports writer for ESPN. He's a Syracuse alum. And I, I'm going to phrase it this way because this is what I think of. When I think of David Hale, he is, I think, one of the most unique sports writers out there. His approach, his humor, his pop culture references, a lot of Simpsons references if you're a fan of The Simpsons. But there are so many times that David Hale will send one tweet, one meme, one Simpsons quote. He'll unearth some unique stat and it just comes into focus. And it's something you probably haven't seen elsewhere and I just really appreciate and love his perspective on things. David and Andrea Adelson at ESPN have a focus on the ACC. They actually have a show on the ACC Network. It's called All ACC. You can see it various times on the ACC Network. Tuesdays at 7 is when it debuts. You can see the clips on social media as well. Of course, read their work on ESPN.com. But yeah, David is just somebody I've really enjoyed following over the years. I would have him on my radio show a lot. We text once in a while off the air, if you will. He's been a helpful resource for me. I've just had questions about certain things. Like David would know that. He's a terrific dude. And I got to give David a lot of credit today. He, he was playing hurt. He was not feeling well. But he's like, nope, let's do it. Let's rock and roll. His chair is breaking halfway through the interview. It's just, as he put it, it's like you when you interview David Hale, like some kind of Dick Van Dyke show type of thing <laughs> has to happen. So we had a lot of fun. I think you'll enjoy the conversation, particularly, you know, if you're somebody that feels like Syracuse football has to make a coaching change, right? And you're certainly entitled to that opinion. Well, what does that mean? What is your plan to follow that up. Is there a Jeff Brom out there? Because Louisville always wanted a guy like Jeff Brom, right? So Syracuse does choose to move on. Well, what's the plan after that? David and I have held this opinion for a long time. It's easy to say. It's easy to tweet. But what's your plan? Are you confident that Syracuse would have the plan to follow that up? We talk NIL, Cal, Stanford, SMU being added to the ACC. And what does that really mean? What did they really accomplish with all that? Let's hear it from the man himself, David Hale. Okay, look, first thing off the bat, we did not coordinate these outfits. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, okay, you can clearly see David is an Eagles fan. He's going top to bottom green. I just happened to pick this shirt today. It's not even close to St. Patrick's Day or, or anything of that nature, but uh, go birds, I guess, David. Uh, after that Jets game, I think we need all the positive vibes we can get. So, um, you know, I blame uh, Taylor Swift somehow for all this. 
<laughs> that's that's the easy thing to do these days. Just circle back to Taylor Swift, and uh, I'm going to put Taylor Swift on the headline of this podcast just to uh, get okay. get the Swift that's the, smart. Uh, yeah. traffic. Yeah, come on, right. you got yeah. it these days, right? Well, I Hashtag appreciate Tay Tay. Hashtag Tay Tay. Yep, there you go, my friend. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. I've got a lot of uh, meaty football stuff to get into. I'm kind of curious, though, whenever we talk to Syracuse alums, David is a Syracuse alum, you know, what's your Syracuse story? Take me through getting to Syracuse and, and the things that stand out to you about uh, when you were here. <laughs> Let's see. What do I recall about Syracuse? Uh, peeing in the sink at Chuck's. There you go. Many, uh, many a uh, brisket, a dinosaur. I think I went to class. I, don't I was going to say, what is the education part? <laughs> you know, I, so I, here, uh, this is, I tell people this only because I think it is good, uh, a good lesson in life. Uh, I wanted to do this my whole life. This is what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, that doesn't stop me from complaining about it constantly now, but it's what I wanted to be when I grew up. Uh, but it always seemed like a thing that, uh, other people did like it wasn't like an actual aspiration right so i went to delaware for undergrad uh had an economics degree i went and worked in accounting for a couple of years it sucked it was miserable i hated it uh the lone perk was i hated it so much that when a buddy of mine called and said let's move to san diego and enjoy life for a couple more years i said sure uh so i spent a couple of years in san diego and while i was out there i uh weaseled my way into some like sports pr stuff uh, mostly because I could write for them. And I was like, this is what I wanted to do all along. Why don't I do this? So uh, I went to grad school and I applied to Syracuse and miraculously I got in. But the key to that whole story, there's two takeaways in my opinion. Uh, one is if you want to do something, go do it. Don't like sell yourself short. Like I uh, really kind of kicked the can for five years, or the better part of my life that I could have been doing more. And instead I was going back to school and drinking way too much. Um, the other thing is, uh, if you're going to go to Syracuse, um, don't preface that with San Diego. That's a terrible transition <laughs> that no one should ever, ever, ever make the San Diego to Syracuse pipeline. You got, you got an exclusive on that one. It seems, but I think your advice is sound and I have the opportunity. I'm an adjunct at Syracuse these days, and I've heard that grad student story at least two or three times a semester. They went to college. And there's nothing wrong with this. Everybody's journey is different. Not everybody walks in at 18 years old and knows exactly what they want to do. My co- my daughter's looking at colleges now, so I'm fascinated that this process has come full circle. But what you said really hits home, David. Like, if you want to do it, at least do it. Try it. And at the very least, you can look back and say, I gave it a shot. The worst thing can be you get down the road you get to be where we're at in our careers and you're like man this is just not what i want to be doing right so do it try it and at the very least you knew it and syracuse kind of guided you through that and you you had a pretty roundabout way there that's interesting i didn't know that san diego story but could you have done it without syracuse you know is is that the final piece of the puzzle that that got you over the hump or, or could there have been another path to get to where you are today yeah, I mean, I always tend to think there's a lot of paths to the same place. And, um, you know, I know a lot of people who have come from other directions to get there, but I know a lot of Syracuse people. I mean, there is a reason that there is the ongoing joke about how many Syracuse people there are in media and sports media in particular. Um, I, For me, the biggest things that I got from it were, I mean, you learn how to do the job. Like, that's the biggest thing like it and i know it is sort of ivory towerish to say like you need to have gone through the right training to do this job like there's many ways to do the job but like learning how to be a professional at this and learning what it takes is so critical to doing it well and you learn that at syracuse practically it's practical experience not just classroom experience and then the other thing is just the relationships that you build so um like, you know, again, I could point to probably a dozen people over the course of my career that uh, kept me from wandering off on another path as I want to do when I see a shiny object somewhere. But I, I uh, my first job after Syracuse was in South Georgia and I covered UGA football and I covered they had an indoor football team there and I covered some high school stuff. And it was uh, not my favorite place that I lived, I'll put it that way. <laughs> And uh, I met uh, I met eventually my wife, my girlfriend at the time there, 
And she was leaving after we'd been dating for like, I don't know, eight months, nine months. And she was leaving to go to Kentucky to get a graduate degree. She'd already been accepted when we met. So I was like, ah, I don't like living here. Screw it. I'm going to, I'm going to go with her. Right. Uh, and, and any number of reasons that was a bad decision that she would tell you now is a terrible decision. <laughs> but um, I get to Kentucky and I had nothing else that I could do. Like I didn't know anything. We're in Lexington. Right. So I ended up with two jobs in Lexington, one of which was working part time at the Herald Theater that I only got because of a connection via a Syracuse alumnus that I didn't even know. I just saw she went to Syracuse and emailed her. and She said, yeah, we actually have a part time job here. Why don't you come in? And the other was uh, I taught journalism at Eastern Kentucky, which I got into because you got to have a master's degree to teach full time at the college level. And not a lot of people have a master's in journalism, but that's one of the weird things of, of going this path. And I did that because, and honestly, virtually every lesson I taught was something I directly ripped off from somebody that <laughs> taught me at Syracuse. So, um, you know, like I that that year and a half of my life was not like this big extraordinarily extraordinary moment, um, but it was this weird in between time between first job and career. And I don't know that I would have survived that in journalism if I hadn't had Syracuse connections to that. So like, oh, need a new desk chair too. Uh, but I look back on that a lot. And I think like, man, I, you know, who knows? There's a million different ways this could have gone in another direction. And, uh, you know, Syracuse is one of those things that kept, keeps you tethered to what you wanted to do. David, uh, from your journey at Syracuse to uh, current state of affairs uh, with the orange chair, uh, it, this is probably the best litmus test you can get for where Syracuse stands in the ACC. You play Clemson, you play North Carolina, you play Florida State. You were nowhere near competitive in the last two. They were outscored 81 to 10. They were in the Clemson game for about a half before, you know, the, the Tigers pulled away and won that game. I think it just reaffirms this is Syracuse's place. They're fighting for that next level title, if you will, right? Maybe once a decade, you might be in the conversation for the ACC championship game, but this is where Syracuse football is. And you've got Dino Babers in year eight, and everybody seems to agree, well, hey, if they win six or seven games in a bowl game, like, hey, you, 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 you check the box, right? But considering Dino is in his eighth year, and you got to try and decide what to do long-term, his contract is up next year, and there's some decisions that have to be made at Syracuse. How do you see this current situation with Dino Babers and what the path forward will be depending on what Syracuse does the rest of the year? Uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack from that. I, first of all, going 0-3 against Clemson, Carolina, and Florida State to me is not a big thing. But coming off of the way that last year went down the stretch – and you look at the, those last two games of these, that three game stretch were not competitive. You wonder psychologically where the locker room is. Like, are you, is, are people throwing up their hands and saying, well, here we are again. And that's, that's a big risk when you have those two kind of narratives back to back like this. Um, but I have said for a long time that Dino's a good fit at Syracuse. Dino gives Syracuse, I think, a chance to be, better than terrible most years and occasionally great uh, or occasionally very, very good. They give you, he gives you a puncher's chance in most games, which if you're Syracuse is probably a good place to be and not, a, I mean, I, I saw somebody on Twitter the other day posted a picture of a uh, post standard story about uh, like Paul Pascaloni at a crossroads from 20 years ago. Where do we go from here? And you know, Paul had a nice little career at Syracuse. For sure. And then it was like, well, six and seven season, get blown out in a bowl game by Georgia Tech, time to move on. And where did that go? Yeah. Uh, that I, I would argue that a decade later, Syracuse was still trying to figure its way back out of that hole. So, I, you know, I, I, I understand the um, desire to occasionally look at where Syracuse is and say, couldn't we be more like, is staying, staying the same a good thing? And I, I think you can make the case that either way. But I, I will say, Dino, I don't know if he got himself in trouble, but he certainly created a little bit of waves last week talking about depth and NIL and the portal and all of that. And here's the thing. He's not wrong. Like, they had three defensive starters who are playing at other Power 5 schools right now. On one hand, that's a huge credit to Dino Babers and identifying talent 
on the recruiting path that uh, he's getting into Syracuse. But keeping that talent in this era at a place like Syracuse becomes next to impossible. And that was a really good, talented team last year with Sean Tucker and Matthew Bergeron and those guys on offense. I mean, look, this year they they lose Tucker, who's probably one of the best running backs they've had in a while. You have those three transfers from defense. You put a couple of guys in the league, including Bergeron. Uh, gets hurt. Gets hurt. Early, yeah. But Syracuse is not a program that can withstand all of that. And so you've got to do one of two things. If you're going to move on, you move on and have a plan for moving on, not just move on because Dino ain't getting it done anymore. And whether you move on or stay with Dino, I think there's got to be a different approach to investment in this program because I just don't think it is um, sustainable for anyone. But Syracuse is a great example in the in the modern era to say, like, look at it, man. We're getting talent from the, from the recruiting ranks, which is a hard enough job at a place like Syracuse. But if we can't keep it, if we can't keep our assistant coaches who leave for other assistant coach jobs somewhere, like that's a huge problem. And, and to me, that has nothing to do with Dino, man. That's just the infrastructure of college sports today and being in a place like Syracuse. I think you hit the nail on the head in a couple of ways. One, you know, let me just circle back to the players you were talking about. The grass isn't always greener, right? Those players, they deuce chestnut. We don't even know if he's on the roster at LSU right now. <laughs> Jihad Carter barely plays at Ohio State. So, yeah, maybe you got a little money in the opportunity to play. The leading rusher in the ACC right now left Syracuse because he was behind Sean Tucker. It wasn't one of those cases where he wasn't going to play or, you know, the grass is greener. He just he had an NFL-level running back ahead of him. So I get the frustration from Dino there. As you said, he's not wrong to express that. And in this case, it wasn't a player that got bought away. It was a player that was sitting behind another NFL level talent. They can get the talent, the, the challenge is keeping them. And again, is that Dino's fault where they're at NIL wise and facility wise and, and all those conversations. I think you hit another good point there about how much of this is Dino versus the current structure at Syracuse. Like they were just trumpeting the new Lally complex, which is under construction and it's look, it's great congratulations to catching up to the rest of the league, right? You were 10 yeah, to 15 years yeah. behind on that. And of course the ever growing NIL conversation, which we'll get into here in a moment. So that leads me to this. Let's say for some reason, they're not satisfied with what happens. They go six and six and they move on in a world where I understand that Dion's the extreme example, but Dion Sanders can infuse the energy he did at Colorado, Jeff Brom at Louisville, Mike Elko at Duke. Like it can be done, David, so what kind of job is Syracuse in the here and now if it becomes available? Again, I think 90% of the battle is having a plan, understanding how you want to build that path. So uh, you, you just mentioned three guys, but I think they're three very different situations. Like Jeff Brom is the guy Louisville wanted for forever. And the entire team's fan base was saying, we need this guy. So that was a good sell to the fan base, an easy way to gin up enthusiasm and dollars. Dion is a complete outsider who you basically bought to headline your movie. You know, that is just getting a big star and putting him into a script that you don't know if it's actually any good, but you've got a big star, so that's going to put butts in seats. Um, Elko was not a sexy hire at all. Nobody paid much attention to it until he went out and – wins nine games his first year and knocks off Clemson in the opener this year. And now that's a different story. And you realize looking back, like, boy, he really is a good fit there. And I wouldn't have thought that, um, you know, I, I, there's not a one size fits all answer here, but I also look at it and you say like, who is the the big star? I don't know that there is another Dion. And frankly, I think you're going to start to see diminishing returns to Dion's stardom if it doesn't lead to something more. Uh, I don't think there is that guy. I mean, unless you want to go out and hire Donovan McNabb to coach your team at Syracuse, like I don't know who that guy is at Syracuse and it's the Jeff Brom of Syracuse. And then it just comes down to you get lucky with a guy like Mike Elko, which I don't know, frankly, that might have been Dino Babers for all we know. So, um, I, you know, I think so much to me, the guy I would actually point to as, as a really good example of this is Dave Clawson at Wake Forest because – he is a a program builder, and he has done it at small places well before he got to Wake Forest. He arrived at Wake Forest with a plan for how he wanted to do it there that overlapped with what the strengths and personality of Wake Forest were. He wasn't trying to sell uh, players on anything other than coming to Wake Forest. And then 
he won enough to be able to start making the sale to get more dollars coming in. And they have massively upgraded their facilities. I mean, that is a good football program top to bottom, despite what their record is right now. But I mean, hey, that even goes to show you that you're sometimes a Sam Hartman away from going from annual contender to in a real bad place when you are a small school like that. But B, I think it really shows that like, it's not necessarily the, this is the guy that fixes it. It's the right guy at the right place with the right plan, with the right backing. And it's got to be this whole sort of mosaic of, of, of the good ideas working together. There has been kind of a running conversation about like, if a guy like Dino doesn't work, then who would, right? Because what you just said, David, and you know this, they've tried everything. You tried an NFL head coach that won a couple of Super Bowls, and that was one of the worst decisions in the history of Syracuse University. Doug Marone was the returning alum, right? Scott Schaefer was the assistant coach that took over. They have tried everything. Pascaloni was there for so long. Coach Mack, and, and I mean, there was a time when Dick McPherson could have run for mayor in Syracuse and won in a <laughs> landslide. I can't think of a scenario they haven't tried. So if you're moving on from Dino, look, Dino's 63 years old. It's going to happen sometime soon. I mean, he's that, he's in great shape for 63 years old. And uh, I'm not saying like he's on the backside of his of his life here, but you got to think about that that kind of thing and the energy and what it takes to be a college football head coach. That comment you brought up about NIL, I mean, that was as bitter as I've heard Dino. Like, I think he's starting to – see you know the forest through the trees here and how difficult it is to win and, and do things at Syracuse but if a coach like Dino doesn't work then you really start to think who could and here's a, another scenario David where it's not even about Dino like is Syracuse going to there's not some secret fund of you know a Scrooge mm. McDuck bank they're going to go to like Syracuse pays what it pays it's not like they're going to you know all of a sudden swoop in and be like all right we got 12 million a year to spend on this thing. So you hate to say if Dino doesn't work, nobody will, but it, in some ways it, it, it feels like that's the kind of path you have to go down that kind of coach. I, yeah. I mean, I, it is like the, the beauty of hiring Dino when they hired him was it's something different in a place that needs to win differently. I mean, it was almost sort of like Georgia tech hiring Paul Johnson. I mean, the opposite of that aesthetically but the idea was the same of like, we can't play the way everybody else is playing. We're not going to out Clemson Clemson. Um, and I think to Dino's credit, he has adjusted every year to what he had around him. He has not tried to force the Dino Baber system onto the wrong set of guys. I, again, I, I, you can go back and, and the numbers are the numbers. At the end of the day, people are judged by wins and losses. Like Dino's done a hell of a job at Syracuse for the most part. And there's, years where things kind of went off the rails and a lot of that was COVID and, and a lot of this is stuff beyond his control. Um, so I, you know, it is, it's, it's a grass ain't always greener situation. As you said, is there somebody out there who could do this better differently? Could a little bit of success really start to, um, you know, gather steam and change things? It's certainly possible, but you know, I'm certainly not going to put Clemson as like not in it anymore. I think Clemson is, in fact, I think there's a good chance to say that like the onus at Clemson is like, we got to double down now. And Florida state's clearly on the, on the come up Louisville's on the come up North Carolina's. I mean, I don't know how long Mac Brown's going to be there, but that's a program trending in the right direction. I mean, the window for Syracuse felt like it was probably two years ago. I mean, that's Wake Forest that Pitt took advantage of that window. Um, I don't think the job's any easier. And you look at what's ahead for college football, and I don't know that any of us know exactly what that looks like. But I mean, it's you know, it it there is a, a trajectory in which Syracuse is sort of the gets left behind. Uh, I don't know that that's going to happen. I think if it does happen, Syracuse will not be the only school with a lot of college sports success that is in the gets left behind category. Uh, because what we're dealing with right now in terms of money and finances and the reality of the landscape and the fact that nobody seems very interested in addressing those very obvious problems or concerns, I mean, something has to change dramatically in order for the fortunes of a place like Syracuse to change. And uh, you can again, throw a bunch of darts at the wall and hope something hits. But I, I, again, where dollars are scarce at a place like Syracuse, that seems like the wrong philosophy to me. And I've seen that happen plenty of places. I mean, you look at a place like Kansas that until they got a really, really good 
Western New York football coach. Uh, <laughs> they and 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 they were just shooting shots at whomever might be the next big thing or was the last big thing. And frankly, you know, I, Lance Leopold's a really damn good head coach, but he's not had a winning season at Kansas yet. We'll see how this year ends. I mean, it's not like he's turned that program into something that Syracuse isn't already. So, uh, you know, I think perspective is everything. And um, there's a lot of market forces working against Syracuse, no matter who the coach is. David, changing gears now that the smoke is cleared and Cal Stanford and SMU are uh, members of hashtag go ACC, what did we do here? Uh, what did we accomplish? What, uh, what exactly uh, did, did we address by adding those three schools to the league before the next uh, round of let's uh, spin the expansion hamster wheel starts again? Damn if I know. Um... <laughs> Look, they're going to give you the spin of great academic schools with a rich history and big investors and blah, blah, blah. Um, To me, this is the ACC has a big branding problem in terms of the reality of where money comes from in college sports. And that problem is that they've got a lot of small private schools in big cities with people where the, the fans have other things to do most days so if you're not good really good if you're not the show i remember talking to greg shiano about Rutgers, and he said you know when we were really good at Rutgers for a couple of years like we could be the show in town but if you're not the show in town ain't nobody showing up because there's too much other stuff to do and so i mean i you know hell even if you're in pittsburgh or berkeley or uh you know certainly atlanta or miami like there's other shit to do if the team's not good well, that's more than half of the ACC, and they just added basically three more schools that fit that profile. So i i don't I don't know it's that they fixed the problem. Yeah. I think what they did was played a basic numbers game, the math, which the math says in their TV contract, you've got to have X number of teams, or else we renegotiate the contract. <clears throat> and for all the talk about wanting to renegotiate the contract up, if Clemson and Florida State walk out the door somebody's going to be looking to renegotiate the contract down. So you keep the numbers so that that can't happen. You keep a, a, a baseline. I, I, you know, <laughs> uh, to me, that is putting some chewing gum in a hole in the dam, like, because the, the path forward is the path forward. And Cal and Stanford certainly aren't changing that dynamic. But um, if it buys you a little bit more time, uh, maybe that's at the end of the day what it is. It'll get some more dollars for – a few people in the short term. I don't think it has any impact on the thinking that Florida State or Clemson or anybody else might have about what their future is. I, I you know, to me, it's a move to say you made a move. And frankly, and I don't put this at the feet of Jim Phillips, who I think wanted to be aggressive in this in this space before his presidents were. But he is a he is beholden to the presidents of of these universities who frankly, what ultimately sold, I think the most of them was like, these are good academic schools. Yeah. Well, that's great. It's a lovely thought, but it's just not reality of how business gets done in college sports these days. Uh, and so they probably should have been chasing expansion with other programs three years ago. And instead, you know, they're getting the bottom of the barrel, basically, of what was left of the Pac-12. Last one for you, David. I don't have the answer to how to regulate nil but i do know this i didn't get the answers at that congressional hearing this week and (laughs) i think if you're turning to congress to fix your problem in this area uh that's the wrong move to start with here and hearing what some of those senators and congressmen said about college sports uh, joe manchin in west virginia by the way should know better (laughs) given the heart of what college sports is in that state that i know is not the answer so when i've got smart people who i think run their leagues well like greg sankey and conference commissioners and athletic directors saying that regulation from congress is the answer i just laugh i know that's not the answer but is there one out there um i it's so funny to me because two years ago there was this whole push and I remember talking to Jim Phillips and Greg Sankey about it of like, we need fewer rules, man. We need deregulation. We need to not 
have our fingerprints on everything. And now it's like they're trying to put the toothpaste back in the tube with that <laughs> exactly. on so many levels. Um, no, I don't think there is. I mean, because there's never going to be, you can put all the, first of all, you can put all the rules in place that you want. We've shown this in the NCAA. They can make up rules with the best of them. They can't enforce anything. Uh, and so, and it certainly isn't going to change behaviors. And even if they did enforce something, what it will be is not the big boys and not the coaches and not the people who are actually were responsible for doing bad things or breaking the rules. It'll just be the next group of players who comes through who gets punished somehow. Uh, it's all, you know, the, the Tez Walker thing at UNC is just sort of poster child for how stupid all of this is. Um, frankly, I talk to more and more coaches and ADs who are just on the, let's pay them, like eliminate these stupid middlemen, uh, get rid of the gray market that we had. We had a black market before. We have a gray market now. Let's just get rid of it. Uh, if we decide we want to invest a bunch of money into paying our players, we'll do it. And if you decide you don't want to, you don't have to. And this whole thing is just dumb that we're doing it this way. Uh, NIL, for whatever it is, is not NIL. It is money being paid to players through a third party. Like it's, And players are not all benefiting from this either. I mean, you mentioned the Syracuse guys who left for more money. Like that's problematic for them and their long-term future in some cases. I mean, I know there's agents out there who are taking 20% pay cuts on an NIL deal brokered through a team's collective. Like, the agent didn't do a damn thing there, and they're taking 20%. <laughs> like, exactly. yeah. all of this is so – like, you know, I am just uh, – you know, again, I'm, I mentioned at the top, I went to Delaware for undergrad in economics. Like, this is just inefficiencies in a market. Like, make the market more efficient and then live with the results because at least then you get to sort of decide what you're – who you want to be, how you want to run things. I think the more you try to uh, bend the market to your idea of moralistic amateurism, the more it doesn't work, the more inefficiencies there's going to be, the more people who are going to pay a very unpleasant price for it. And the more the already haves, the Alabamas and Ohio States of the world, they're going to flourish just as they always have. David is a terrific follow on Twitter, folks. If you want your sports analysis mixed in with the Simpsons, there is no one better than <laughs> David to bring you that. But the great numbers and analytics and things you don't see anywhere else. All ACC with Andrea Adelson Tuesday nights at 7, if I'm not mistaken, David. Correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think we make it up as we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so supposedly Tuesday nights at 7 when basketball starts, that's going to change things. The beauty is I had we were visiting with Nina King, the AD at Duke, a couple of weeks ago. And she was like, you know, I was sitting at home. I had the TV on in the background. I'm doing some work. And I was like, oh, there's, there's Hale and Andrea on TV. She's like, I'm working a little bit longer. And I'm like, didn't I hear them say this already? Oh, they're just replaying it five times. <laughs> so, you know, leave ACC Network on. Eventually you'll see us is the, is the answer here. There you go. And you can see it all on social media, of course, and ESPN.com as well. David, thank you uh, for playing Hurt a little bit today. It's great to see. It's great to hear from you. We'll do it down the road. But thanks for hopping on Syracuse Sports with us today, my friend. My pleasure. Our thanks again to David Hale from ESPN for joining us. Love that conversation with him, and I appreciate him playing hurt on the show today for sure. Just a reminder, there is no Syracuse football postgame show this weekend with Emily Liker and I because, well, there's no Syracuse football. They're going to enjoy their bye week, and then things really get interesting at Virginia Tech on a Thursday night. Boston College, first home game in over a month at the Dome to follow on a Friday night and how Syracuse football does down the stretch. But uh, Emily and I have been doing the postgame show live on Syracuse Orange Sports on YouTube, on Syracuse Orange Football, on Syracuse.com, on Facebook. You can follow me on Twitter, Brent Dax Media as well. And the live post-game show, which also is a podcast. Don't worry if you miss it live. It certainly can be found on all the places you listen to and watch this podcast. But obviously we won't be doing one this weekend because Syracuse is off. But we will be doing a mailbag episode coming up. And fire them off. What's on your mind? What do you want to know? What do you want to express? What do you want to talk about? The voicemail, 315-552-1964. Hit me on Twitter, Brent Axe Media. Or the email is B A X E at syracuse.com an upcoming episode which is entirely devoted to your questions your thoughts what you want to know from me or just things that you want to express let's hear from you ladies and gentlemen upcoming episode of syracuse sports and all 
mailbag edition. Looking forward to that. Uh, please subscribe on all the places, YouTube, Amazon, Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find us. We do thank you for watching and listening and being a part of this experience. Tell your friends. The community is growing. We love that you're a part of it, but we can be that much bigger. And we're kicking into overdrive, folks. Football's coming down the stretch. Basketball is just around the corner. If you missed our previous episode of Syracuse Sports, the best things I heard at Syracuse Basketball Media Day, you can find that in our podcast feed on YouTube. Go back and listen to some great sound bites from the Syracuse basketball team from their media day last week. Thanks for hanging with us here on Syracuse Sports, presented by Kraus Health, the exclusive healthcare provider for Syracuse Athletics. We'll talk to you next time, friends.